Good evening and welcome to St. Hilda's. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you here, although we can see that the sunshine and exam season is keeping some people away from attending, but we're delighted to have you here. It's the third and final event of this academic year series of Brain and Mind, From Concrete to Abstract, with the title Time and the Brain. Um, you should have a program on your seats where you can see the program, the um, abstracts, the titles of the talks, and also um, a bit of background information on our guest speakers today. Many of you will have attended these workshops before, but let me just briefly explain you what they're all about. So we are trying to approach various um, topics that are invariably highly complex from the point of view of three, at least three different disciplines, neuroscience, psychology, and philosophy. And each of our guest speakers represents one of these um, disciplines here. Uh, what we're having is three talks and two discussion rounds, and we very much hope that you will take active part in the discussions. The whole point is that it is interdisciplinary and interactive. Um, before we start, I would like to encourage you to find us um, online. All you have to do is in Google type in Brain and Mind from Concrete to Abstract, and our webpage will pop up. What you can also do is find us by navigating the St. Hilda's research pages. And you can find their past events, you can find some um, recordings of past events, not all unfortunately, um, and you will also see the new events that are um, advertised there. And I'm delighted that I can already tell you that next year in Hillary term, I think it is, we're having art and the brain, and we're particularly pleased because our very own Val. In but in Hillary, art. isn't it art? No, it's Hillary, it's criminality. Okay, so, so it's Mikamas. Mikamas, sorry, in Mikamas, it'll be posted on the webpage. We'll have Art and the Brain, and we have our very own Val McDermott come and speak, which is very exciting. So the dates and the speakers will be posted, um, whoops, just move forward here, um, online. Um, I would like to thank at this point, on behalf of the executive committee, which is composed of Dr. Anita Avramidis, um, Steve McHugh, and Anne Dauka, and myself, I would like to thank the college for its financial and administrative support, um, in particular, Marlisa and um, Susie, who've been absolutely stellar in organizing the whole event and helping us um, getting organized here. Uh, without the financial support of the college, we would not be able to offer this event free of charge to everybody, um, and we think that this is a vital part um, of college life, to be able to introduce audiences to all sorts of different disciplines. Um, so tonight's topic is time and the brain. As a neuroscientist, that's a particularly intriguing topic, uh, which has only fairly recently, due to experimental limitations, found the attention that it deserves. Um, time is, of course, vital to human life, to every life. We cross a road and we need to be able to have enough time to cross the road safely or will it be squashed by a car. Time comes in communication. Do I use a long vowel in a word or a short vowel that might completely change the meaning of the word that I'm saying? And then there's the whole point of movements, of course. Movement has to be coordinated. Muscle contractions and relaxations have to be coordinated. And just think of the following scenario. Somebody's asking us to hold our hands behind our back and they will throw a ball at us and tell us to only catch it at the last minute before we get hit. We will all be able to do that. So our brain has to fulfill this amazing task of calculating how long will it take for us to move our hands, catch the ball, and how fast is actually the ball coming at us. And we can all do it, which is an amazing feat. And then there's a whole different aspect, which our first guest speaker will talk about, and that is that we have a concept of things having happened in the past and being able to relate it in a chron chronologically correct order. So we will all be able to say, what have I done today? And we'll start with, I got up and we'll end with, I went to St. Hilda's to attend the workshop. Um, and this is probably achieved by cells that we now think that we call time cells, which are located in the hippocampus, uh, which are, so that's a part of the brain involved in memory and learning. Um, and these cells seem to reflect, the activity of these cells seems to reflect um, activity patterns in a time-dependent manner. Um, it's enough for me, our guest speaker, knows far more about this than I do. So our first speaker is Professor Edmund Rolls from the University of Warwick and the Oxford Center for Computational Neuroscience. And the talk, topic of his talk will be time and the brain and episodic memories. And I'm sorry, I've moved your slides forward by mistake. So you have to go back. Good, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> um, 
So I'm going to talk um, about how time is encoded in the brain. We've only started to learn about that really quite recently, so this is an exciting topic. And uh, I have some information to communicate to you from a Nobel Prize winner, Edouard Moser, which he talked about in California two weeks ago, and which is unpublished, and which is quite interesting. Okay, episodic memory. That's your memory for a particular um, event or series of events, what perhaps you were doing at breakfast. And uh, we know more or less how it works in terms of associating who was there um, and where it was. And the new thing I want to tell you about is what we think about um, how time gets into it if several things happened in sequence. So first of all, let me just say that uh, the work I present is done with a lot of colleagues who are named here. And there's a recent book, uh, Cerebral Cortex, that describes some of the findings. So episodic memory. Um, basically, it's something to do with the hippocampus. Uh, people who have bilateral hippocampal damage, shown there, um, <clears throat> don't remember what they've been doing in the last, well, since the brain lesion, basically. Um, so the bit of the brain, the hippocampus, that does this is interesting. Uh, it receives down here, this is a medial view of the temporal lobe of the brain, from perirhinal cortex, the hippocampus. Um, but it receives information from both the ventral visual stream that tells us what things are, and from the dorsal visual stream that tells us where things are. So we can remember where we saw a particular person by associating together information from parietal cortex and temporal cortex, which comes down through these bits of the brain, including interrhinal, to CA3, which is part of the hippocampus, as is CA1. And it turns out that what this bit of the brain does is it has a single network in it that's connected by recurrent collateral connections, RC there, so that any one neuron which might code an object can be associated with an, any other neuron which might code a place. So by having a single network in that bit of the brain, you can associate potentially any object with any place. When I say single neuron, of course it's all uh, represented across many neurons, but the concept is a single representation of an object can be associated with a single representation of a place to help form an episodic memory. Now, here's what we know about what happens in this bit of the brain, the hippocampus, in rats. Uh, this is an arena in which a rat is running round, and red indicates the hippocampal neuron is firing fast. Um, so that's called a place cell. It codes for one location in space. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, in the bit of the brain that precedes this, one has a whole series of places that are represented by a single cell. It, they form a hexagonal grid, and that's quite important in setting up the code, it turns out, for place cells in the hippocampus. And we'll see that there's something like that that happens for time in a minute. Okay. Um, that won't really do for you. Um, you couldn't form an episodic memory with a place cell. You've perhaps never been up here, and yet you can remember by looking at me that Edmund Rolls is standing up on this podium. Now, a place cell could never do that um, because the place cells inside you code for where you are, not where you're looking in space. So what happens in us? Well, we think what happens, and suddenly this thing seems to have gone out of, oh, here it is, focus a bit, um, <clears throat> is the following. This is an arena um, in which we record from a monkey who's walking around in a two-meter space. And these are the walls of the arena shown in these rectangles. What you can see is that this single brain cell where I've put a spot for every signal or action potential from the cell is firing when the monkey looks at this wall but not so much when he's looking at the other walls. That's the outer set of rectangles. So this is what we call a spatial view cell. Just to give you the real idea, um, if you're looking at me, you'll have some spatial view cells in your hippocampus that'll be coding for uh, this location in space that you're looking at. And if you're looking at someone over there, some other cells will be active, okay? For coding for that position in space. <clears throat> 
Now, I want to show you a bit more about what these cells are like, because they're quite remarkable. Um, this would be our monkey sort of walking around. And then on these rectangles, I'm going to put a spot whenever an action potential, which you'll hear is a little noise, sounds from a single hippocampal neuron. And I just want you to get an idea of roughly what these interesting neurons are like, because I think they're in your brain. So that's the monkey walking around, and you can see where he's looking. So you can see that that sort of cell seems to code for some location out there that's being viewed at. And that's really quite different from what is found in rodents. Now, I'm going to say that I think the reason for this big difference is that primates have a fovea. And so we look only at one small location in space at a time. So what we can code is determined by where we're fixating. And so fixating around different bits of the room gives different spatial view cells. But in the rodent, they have an almost all-round field of view. In fact, it's 270 degrees. So if a rodent place cell uh, triangulates this Q, this Q, and this Q, it tends to represent a place, as shown in this simulation, a place in the arena, but if we triangulate three cues close together at the fovea in a human or monkey, then we're going to find a location on the wall that's being looked at, uh, which is encoded. So I think that's the reason why we have the different encoding scheme. Now, this system is involved in memory. In this case, the monkey's doing an object place memory task. He has to remember that this object is rewarded in that location and that he gets a punishment salt in that location. And here, he gets a punishment for a triangle, but here, uh, he gets a reward, a nice fruit juice. Um, so the monkey can only solve this by remembering uh, the object and the place where it's located. What I simply want to show you is that some cells, and this is the firing rate being plotted up here, have a big response to a combination of one object and one place and don't respond to objects and places otherwise. So, in fact, that is represented in, I think, your hippocampus. A lot of neurons, about 15%, are going to objects seen in particular locations. Now, I think that's the basis of episodic memory. And I think that's implemented, as I've said, in this CA3 recurrent collateral system, whereby different coactive neurons can become associated together by learning um, an associative link between them, a synaptic modification. And this is just to show you how magnificent these neurons are. That's a single CO3 neuron, and here's one of its recurrent collaterals, and here's another. So they really extend throughout CO3. And we happen to have produced a quantitative theory of how this whole lot works. And what I can tell you is what determines the number of memories is the number of synapses on any one neuron. So a rat can store about 12,000 memories in its hippocampus, and a human probably 20 to 30,000. OK, so that's what we knew until recently about episodic memory. You can associate together objects and places. But what about time? What happens if we have several items to remember in an episodic memory? Well, the first hint about this is that the sequential order of items in a single episodic memory may be important. Um, <clears throat> and uh, one of my colleagues, Ray Kessner, showed some time ago that if he made CA1 lesions of the rat, that's the bit of the hippocampus that follows CA3, then his rats couldn't remember the order in which they had visited three arms. So that's been around for some time, that CA1 may have something to do with temporal order. Then there was a discovery that um, Howard Eichenbaum made of time cells in the hippocampus during a 10-second delay. I'm going to show you one of those. Um, and uh, some of these cells, 
code for time, some for place, and some for both place and time. So let's have a look at a time cell, or in fact a series of time cells. So here's what we're doing. We're looking at a 10 second delay here, and there are lots of trials. Each little row here is a separate trial. So this is one neuron, and you can see that it's firing fairly close to the start of the time interval. Here's a second neuron that fires a little bit later in the time interval, a third neuron that fires a little bit later, and so on. So each neuron is coding for a different part of a 10 second time interval. So time is being encoded by CA1 neurons. That's been discovered in the last 10 years. Now, the bit of the brain in which these are particularly found so far has been CA1. Here's CA3, the bit that associates together objects and places. So it looks as if you add in the temporal order in the next stage on in CA1 by these time encoding neurons. And so I want to talk a little bit about then CA1, but also this bit of the brain, the medial entorhinal cortex, which has the grid cells for space, and then the lateral entorhinal cortex. So here's a recording that's uh, made, in fact, from CA1. What we've got is 206 neurons here, and this is time going in that direction, seven seconds, while the rat is running in a treadmill. And uh, these neurons have been ordered with their red showing the highest firing rate so that neuron number one fires closest to the start of this interval and neuron number 206 uh, fires closest to the end of it. What you can see is that there are lots of neurons that are coding each one for its own delay in that task. Okay? So that's how time, we think, is encoded now in the hippocampus. Um, by having neurons that have a firing rate that peaks at a particular time. And what this particular slide shows is the medial entorhinal cortex is necessary for this CA1 uh, firing because if you inactivate the medial orbitofrontal cortex, instead of being able to read out the code nicely, the code just breaks down. So medial entorhinal cortex, we think, may be where the code is being generated. Um, so I've shown you up to about here. Here's the recent stuff from Edouard Moser, who got a Nobel Prize about three years ago, uh, with Albert Sauer. So they've been having a look in entorhinal cortex in more detail. And what they find is that there are many time encoding cells in the lateral orbitofrontal cortex, the bit that we think brings the information about objects and people into this part of the brain. Um, and in fact, if he tries to work out what the time is being represented in the brain by reading from lots of these neurons, then he can decode time, read it off much better from lateral entorhinal cortex than medial entorhinal cortex or CA3. And CA1 is intermediate. And this is, in fact, in quite a long time period. He can read off uh, the time effectively in a five minute period. Um, and this shows you that the coding is a little less good if you code for the time in a shorter period. So here's the interesting thing, which I can't show you a slide on because it hasn't been um, <clears throat> published yet. Um, but just try and look at me for a moment and I'll give you a graphical illustration of how these very interesting lateral cells respond. So we've got time running along here and firing rate up here. So we have time and then one of these cells goes up and then slowly decays like that. And another cell might start up at a different time quite suddenly and then it slowly decays. So it looks as if this bit of the brain, lateral entorhinal cortex, has cells that show adaptation. Their firing rates uh, start to decline over time because something is adapting out inside them. And I think that's the mechanism by which time is being encoded. Uh, different neurons have different adaptation time constants. So incidentally, these cells have been seen also in monkeys. Now here's, in a little bit more detail, what I think the mechanism is. So we simulated some time ago um, a network where we had 
um, 10 populations of cells, and we could fire off one population at time interval one, a second population at another interval. And this is what we call an attractor network, a little positive feedback network. And uh, what we added to this network was adaptation of the neurons. That is, um, the neurons or their synapses gradually over a few seconds became less responsive. And you can see that going down here. Now, as the firing rate went down from one population, that meant there wasn't inhibition on another population. So here's a black population of neurons that came up for about half a second. They adapted, and after they adapted, another population came up. So I think that's roughly how it's working. These neuronal populations are in competition with each other. And uh, after one adapts, another one can jump up. So that's the mechanism I'm suggesting, that basically um, one has adaptation, and that's an example of a paper which shows it. Um, this may also be important, it turns out, for spatial representations. So my suggestion is that these lateral entorhinal cortex grid time cells would be converted into conventional time cells uh, in CA1 by what we call competitive learning, and there's a paper that describes it. So here's the most important conclusion from my talk today. The time cells now discovered in entorhinal cortex and hippocampus may contribute by encoding the sequence and approximate timing within a single episodic memory, which may include several object place events. So that works reasonably for a a, a typical time of an episodic memory. It doesn't work for very long times. So if you want to remember, for example, what happened on your fifth birthday, you have to use other things than this sort of timing. You have to use contextual information. You remember sort of how large you were perhaps, and perhaps you have semantic information. You remember on your fifth birthday that you were five years old, which helps you. Um, Okay, so that's, those are the main conclusions I want to tell you. We're starting to understand a bit about how time works in the brain. But I have just got one last slide, which I want to use to extend this picture a bit to other things. Um, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, just up here, is involved in short-term memory. So it sort of remembers events over time. It's, it's not clear it's quite as good at doing temporal order as the hippocampus. Here's something else which may interest you. At one time, we studied many patients with damage to their orbitofrontal cortex. And many of these were young men who might have fallen off a motor bicycle, for example. Um, they tend to be very impulsive, and their personality has changed. But one of the tests we gave them was to measure how well they could reproduce time. What we found is that they underproduced time intervals. If we asked them to time for 10 seconds, they would come back to us after seven seconds and say, oh, the time interval is up. Um, and uh, correspondingly, they overestimate the length of the time. So uh, this is an interesting observation. I don't think the timing mechanism is in orbitofrontal cortex, but it's linking in with emotional systems and I think this contributes to their impulsive behavior. The fact that they think the time has elapsed may be something that helps to make them a bit impulsive. Okay. And then here's the last point I want to make. Um, time is also, and order, of course, terribly important in syntax in some languages. So how does that work? Um, we think it works by somewhat similar processes with these attractor networks which hold one item and then they're linked to the next item, and then to the next item by strong forward connections. So with a bit of adaptation, you have a sequence from, say, subject to verb to object through a series of networks. And we've published the first paper on how syntax might be implemented in the brain. However, um, just to go back to the main topic I've talked about, I want to emphasize that now time cells have been discovered in the brain and are probably quite useful in episodic memory by enabling you to remember the order in which items in a single episodic memory happened. And I'll stop there.
Thank you very much. That was a very fascinating talk. Our next guest speaker is Professor Teresa McCormick from Queen's University. Um, she will address the questions, are animals and small children stuck in time? Professor Rolls is quite happy to take them. Yes. And uh, to make contact with um, arts colleagues, uh, there's um, a method called Ars Memoriae of remembering speech in which you stick um, each item of the speech onto a scene. And uh, we have an explanation for that. The explanation is that because space is continuous, the representation in your brain has to be continuous. And we've shown that it is of space. And so by doing a simple association of each part of your speech onto a scene, if later on you work your way through the scene, then automatically you get the sequence right because of the structure of space, but it's continuous. So that's... You'll have a fixed group rather Exactly, because, you, yes. So it's a property of space that it's continuous and that helps you to do this type of memory. And the interesting thing is that time is also continuous, of course, and that seems to also get into the hippocampus. So there's a slightly bigger idea that the hippocampus may be involved in representations, many of which are continuous. So time, space, but even other dimensions, possibly. Just ask about the last point you meant you, you mentioned about syntax, because I wondered whether that had any implications for language learning, because I was thinking something like German, <laughs> you'd have to remember a lot more of the sentence to get the verb at the end, and then I just wondered whether there was anything to say that learning certain languages um, were easier when you were young, or is there something about these cells that don't die off or uh, regenerate later, later in life? I swore I would never study language because it's too hard, but then I got sucked into it. Um, and one of the predictions from the way we think about how syntax is implemented is that uh, if the word order is different in different languages, you could not use the same network in the brain to implement those. And so that's quite a strong prediction. And there's a bit of evidence that supports it. Uh, there are some patients who can lose one language but retain another language, which implies that they are indeed in separate networks. And that's a very interesting point you raise. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, so I'm a developmental psychologist, so I'm going to be talking about some work uh, with children. I'm going to mention animal work briefly, uh, but just as a way of introducing some of the issues that I'm going to be talking about today. So the title is Our Children and Animals Stuck in Time. Uh, what do we mean by being stuck in time? So here's a famous quote from Nietzsche. Consider the cattle grazing as they pass you by. They do not know what is meant by yesterday or today. They leap about, eat, rest, digest, leap about again. And so from morn to night and from day to day, better to the moment. So the idea there is that um, animals potentially are kind of stuck in the now and they're not able to think about past times or future times. So we can also express it in terms of this idea here that if you are stuck in time, you're not capable of tense thought. You simply cannot have thoughts about the past or about the future. Now, the idea that animals are somehow cognitively stuck in time has a long history, particularly in philosophy. But in fact, it's become quite a controversial idea. So quite a lot of um, researchers who, who um, work with animals now have argued that animals are capable of what some people have called mental time travel. So this idea has gained some currency. What do they mean by mental time travel? So mental time travel just is the ability that we're very familiar with um, of remembering particular episodes, so episodic memories of our past, and also imagining into the future, so imagining things that might happen in our personal futures as well. Um, and some people have argued that animals are indeed capable of this sort of mental time travel, that it's not a uniquely human ability. Now, all I really want to do is to point out that this is a controversial issue, um, and that it's not necessarily straightforwardly resolved yet within the literature. So if we wanted to put a case together to argue that animals um, weren't capable of mental time travel, we'd have to explain somehow how a creature that's incapable of tense thought would deal with a changing world. Now, one very simple way in which you might say that a creature not capable of tense thought would deal with a changing world is to come up with a very simple model like this. So it could be the case, for example, um, uh, that some sort of creature would start out with one model of the world, a change would happen in the world, and it would update its model appropriately. So it now updates it so it has a second, a new model of the world. Um, and then a further change happens, and then it updates its model of the world again. Now, doing this, you could describe this as temple updating. You're just updating as changes happen through time. But note that if this is all that we say that the creature has, it's not representing time itself as a dimension. Okay? So um, that's quite different from what we as adult humans are able to do. So as adult humans, we can represent time itself as a dimension. So we can represent time as a dimension. We can think of there being particular points in time, say, for example, A, B, and C. And we can think of some of those points in time as being in the past, one of those points in time as being right now, and some as being in the future. Now, of course, we also grasp that there are systematic changes in what counts as past, present, and future. So for me, um, our, my now is being here right now giving this talk. But what was now for me yesterday was quite different. So what was now for me was the day before, yesterday was the day before I was giving the talk. And from that point of view, um, the giving of the talk was still in the future. Okay, so this is the type of thought that we about as, as adults are capable of. Now, all I want to do is very briefly mention some of the animals. I say I'm not an animal researcher and I don't really have an ax to grind um, in this debate, but I just want to say that it's not necessarily obvious that you can rule out the possibility that animals simply rely just on temple of data. So here's a very famous experiment um, uh, conducted, perhaps the most famous experiment on episodic memory in, in animals, conducted back in 1998 by uh, Clayton and Dickinson. And what happens in this um, uh, uh, particular research study is that there are little birds. There are scrub jays, and the scrub jays have a distinctive type of behavior. They hide foods, or they cache foods, for later discovery. Um, so they essentially, they save foods for later on. And what happened in the study is that um, the birds were initially had a pre-training trial where they demonstrated that the worms, so they particularly like worms, okay? Worms are one of their favorite foods. Um, but it's demonstrated to them that worms degrade over a 124-hour period. So after this time period, the worms will be no longer good to eat. 
Now here's how one trial the experiment runs. So what happens is the birds are initially presented with two different trays. So there's, this is tray one and this is tray two. Um, and they cache or hide the worms in tray one. And tray two isn't available to them at that point. Okay? Then there's a delay. The delay is 120 hours here, so it's a long delay. And the bird comes back again, and the two trays are in front of it once more, two different trays. Now, at this point, tray one is not available. Okay? Um, they only have tray two available to them. And they, cache, they were able to cache in tray two some peanuts, which they also like, but they don't like as much as the worms. Okay, then in the final stage of the task, there's a further delay of four hours, and then the birds are um, given access to the two trays again. And the question is, what will the birds do? Where will they search? Will they search here for the peanuts, which are their less preferred food, um, or will they search here, which would not be any good to them because these worms would already have degraded over the time period in question? Now, um, uh, arguably, there's one way you could try and explain the bird's success in this task, because the birds are indeed successful in this task. They're sensitive to the length of this delay, and they will tend to search for peanuts under these circumstances, but not when the delay here is a short one. So on a kind of what's called a mental time travel account of what's going on here, the birds are doing something like this tray and freeze now. So, Worms, were, they're remembering worms being cached back in tray one. They're remembering that that caching event took place 124 hours ago. They know that worms degrade over that period. Therefore, the worms are inedible. Therefore, they should search in tray two. So that's, the, that's essentially what's meant to be going on. Now, if you wanted to argue that birds were not capable of tense thought, you should rule out this as an explanation and you might come back to having to assume that the birds are just operating with some sort of representation like this. So there's no edible food in tray one, there's peanuts in tray two, so you should search in tray two. Now note there's no tense contents here. So the issue is, how could birds ever end up with this sort of um, uh, correct representation of how things are in the world if they're not actually representing time as a dimension itself? Well, there's a potentially a simple explanation of this which is potentially that the worms could, or the birds could start out with a model of the world in which there are edible worms in tray one, so that's how they start out. Then there could be some kind of timing mechanism um, that, uh, that um, kicks off or starts like in some kind of clock type process when they hide um, the worms in tray one. Um, after 120 hours, uh, the clock will now show, or will now have reached a particular state or phase or have timed a particular length of time, and it could be um, that the state of this clock simply governs the content of the bird's representation of the world. So it could be that they simply no longer uh, represent there being edible worms in tray one. They have a different model of the world that's governed by the operation of a timer. Now, this explanation of the bird's behavior is not um, uh, necessarily the accepted explanation in the literature, as some of the psychologists might know. Um, but I just wanted to point out here that um, uh, the difficulty of trying to prove that birds or any other type of animal really are capable of thinking about the past and also the future. So the take home message from this tiny, this little bit of the talk about animals is that it could be the case that you could have updating of models of the world that could be time dependent on animals, but that doesn't mean that animals can necessarily represent the dimension of time. And this is the key point here, having and using information that stems from the past um, which uh, uh, the creatures can do, does not necessarily mean that an animal can think about the past itself. That's something different. Okay, so I'm going to leave the animal stuff behind. As I say, I'm not an animal researcher. I don't necessarily have an axe to grind on this. I want to turn now to the developmental research in which we can ask sort of similar questions about children. So, um, can we assume that young children are also stuck in time in some sort of a way, or are only capable of temporal updating? So what I want to say is that two of the commonly used tasks that are meant to demonstrate that children can think about other times can also be explained um, without assuming that children are capable of tense thought. So for example, a commonly used task in the literature um, of uh, memory in children is a deferred imitation task. So let me show you how deferred imitation tasks work. So here's how it works. Here's an example of a quite a sophisticated deferred imitation task where um, children are brought into the lab and um, what they see is this light box here and in order to, the, the experimenter demonstrates that to make the light box work, what you have to do is you have to 
turn or pull two of these uh, little levers in a particular order, um, uh, in, in particular locations, in a particular order, in order to get the, time, the, time, the lights to come on. And then the children are brought back after a delay, and the question is now, will they produce the appropriate action sequence? So here's one way in you, which you could describe how children solve this task. They might be mentally time traveling, as it were, and saying, when I was here before doing it, then why made the lights come on? Or you could say, well, all they've got is this sort of tense content here, doing X, then Y makes the lights come on. And that would be sufficient in order to explain their behavior. You don't need to assume that they're actually remembering the specific event of being in and, and watching the event previously. OK. Um, the second example here is uh, an example of a task that's meant to demonstrate that children are capable of future thinking. So um, in this type of task, this is called the two rooms task. Um, the children are initially introduced to a piece of apparatus here, and the piece of apparatus has a particular key that makes it um, open so that it releases some stickers, and children learn how to use this tool here to make the apparatus open. And then um, the key that they use here, this tool, is broken, so it's taken away, and children go into a different room, and they play with different toys, and then um, the experimenter says to them, okay, we're going to go back to room A now, what do you want to bring? Well, what I would argue is, again, there's two possible ways in which you could explain children's ability to choose the right item here. So you could say, okay, the child's gone through some sort of exercise like this in mental time travel. I'm going to be back in the room with the box. I'm going to need the key then. Alternatively, you might think of um, the content of the child's representation as being something like this. The box is in room A. The key operates the box. I'm going to take the key or I take the key. Um, and I suppose if you want them to characterize it here, what you're saying is the child has some sort of representation of a spatially extended world that covers things that it can't see right now, but it's not necessarily operating with a, with a temporally extended representation of the world. So that's something that you might want to argue if you want to argue that this task in itself doesn't show that children are capable of mental time travel to the future. Okay, so what I want to turn now, I'm going to say two more things. So one is to... Um, describe some studies that show tasks that uh, very young children definitively do have difficulties with. They don't, they, they don't typically have difficulties with the tasks that I've just described, although the tool saving task is not typically passed in children, until children are about four. Um, so here's some things that uh, very young children struggle with. One thing they struggle with is not getting information about changes of, in the world in the order in which changes have actually happened. Now, that sounds mysterious, but I'm going to explain it to you now using uh, an example of a task that we've um, used to demonstrate this. So this is called the hairbrush task, and it's a slightly weird task. What happens is children are introduced to these two little characters here, and they're told that the two characters, and they see this, always do things in a certain order. So he always goes first, and he always goes second, and they see the children doing this in different rooms in the house. And then the there, there's another room in the house, uh, in which there's a hairbrush and two cupboards, a blue cupboard and a red cupboard. And uh, what happens is the two characters go up to this room here, and now the door is closed. So now some changes are going to happen, but children cannot see those changes happening, although they're aware that they are. So what they're told is that one of the characters gets the hairbrush, puts it in one of the cupboards, not told which, um, and then the other character gets the hairbrush out of that cupboard and puts it in the different cupboard. Okay, so now they know the hairbrush has been moved around, uh, but they don't know, they haven't found out about the order of the changes of the hairbrush's location in the order in which uh, those changes have actually happened. At the test phase, here's what happens. Um, so what you're wanting the children to do is to tell you where the hairbrush is right now. And um, children are shown where each character put the hairbrush. So he put it in the blue one, he put it in the red one. Now, in order to answer the question about where the hairbrush is right now, you have to reason about order. You have to say, well, he put it in there, then he got it, and he put it in there, so it's in there right now. And this is something that uh, uh, three-year-olds cannot do. At least that's what we find in our experiments. Okay, so they have difficulty here reasoning about temporal order. I'm going to describe one last experiment um, that suggests they also have difficulty reasoning about order, when it, um, the events in question are in the future rather than the past. And this is a circumstance in which children have to think ahead about what needs to be done right now to prepare for the future, given the order in which future events are going to unfold. 
So, um, this is called the zoo task. Sorry, I'm, I can't seem to get it. Yeah, so what happens in this task is children are told about a character who's visiting a zoo called Molly. And Molly really likes kangaroos. And Molly wants to take a photograph of a kangaroo using her rather retro um, camera here. And um, so this was 2008 when these cameras were sort of still around. And, uh, uh, but what they're told is Molly doesn't have a bag to put her camera in. Uh, so what you have to do is you have to put the camera in one of these boxes here so that Molly can pick it up and she'll have it when she takes a photograph of the kangaroo. And children are told that the character is going to, Molly is going to travel around the zoo either this way or this way. We counterbalance the order in which they get back. Okay. Um, and what you, of course, the correct answer if she's going this way is to put the camera in here because she needs to get it by the time she gets to the kangaroo. Now, what this task requires is something a bit like this. The children have to think about the order of these events here. So this is visiting the first um, uh, box. This is visiting the kangaroo. And they've got to realise that at some point, potentially, they've got to realise that the visit of the kangaroo is going to be now, as it were, and they better make sure that, they ha that um, the picking up of the camera is in the past so that they have it by the time they get to uh, the kangaroo's location. Again, what we find is that children um, who are around three to four have a lot of difficulties with this specific type of task. We find it's not until children are five that they pass it. Okay. Um, so how much time have I got? Have I covered? I know I started late, so I'm not quite sure. Have I got five minutes? Yeah, I've got five minutes. Okay. Now, you might think from what I've said that I think that um, very young children are very limited in their temporal abilities, but that wouldn't be straightforwardly true. Anyone who's got a young child knows that by the time children are three or indeed two, almost from the time they start using language, they use tense language and they generally use it accurately. Also, if you talk to them about the past and the future, you might have to scaffold them a lot, but you can potentially get them to provide snippets of information about particular past and future events. Okay? So it doesn't look as if they know nothing about the past and the future. They're not just, as I've put it previously, temporal updaters. They're something more, but they're not full-blown full blown temporal reasoners. So the question is, how should we characterize children's temporal cognition at this stage, their temporal thinking abilities? And what I've suggested is that perhaps they're able to make a distinction between the past and the future, the de facto, what are the past and future events. So they're able to somehow classify some events as, as being in one category and other events as being in another category that de facto are in the past or de facto in the future. Um, uh, but they're just making some sort of categorical distinction between events without really knowing anything about how these events are systematically related in time. That's the suggestion. So um, uh, I'll just skip this last point, but one way you might argue that they make this categorical distinction is they might think of some events in the future as being potentially alterable and some of the events as being in the past, although they're not thinking about them in the past as such, as being not alterable. That could be one basis on which you might make the distinction. So here's what I want to suggest, that there may be an age around two to three years when children are capable only of what I call event-based thinking about time. And then they shift by around four to five years to become capable of linear event-independent thought about time. And let me say something about two differences between these things. So the first difference is that here, the child is only representing events rather than times per se. And I'll say more about that in a second. The second thing is that these are not systematically related in, along the dimension of time, whereas these are. Okay? So the suggestion is that there are both these sorts of shifts uh, that occur developmentally around this time period. Now let me just flesh out a tiny little bit more about this distinction between event-based time and event-independent time, and then I'll finish. Okay. Well, what is it to think about time rather than to just think about events? Well, um, we think as adults about times in an event-independent way, just as we can think about space as in an object-independent way. So I think of this space as being here, even if you move those objects away or put different objects in it. I can think of that space independently of the objects that are in it. And it's the same with times. We can think about times independently of any specific events that did happen or will happen in those times. And that's particularly important in terms of us grasping the nature of the future. 
So for example, if we're here right now, there are a number of different things here, a number of different ways in which um, uh, future events might, un uh, uh, events might unfold at point D here. Okay, so this is time point D. There are a number of different possibilities. And this is the, what I would say is the hallmark of being able to think about time rather than just think about events. You can think about multiple possibilities. So let me just finish with one final experiment that suggests that before around the age of about five years, children do have difficulty thinking about times in this way. And this is um, a nice experiment by Sarah Beck, who turns out um, taught many years ago. Uh, at the, she's now at the University of Birmingham, and she did this lovely study looking at whether children understand possibilities, that the future, there might be multiple possible ways in which the future might turn out. So in this experiment, there's a shoot, it'll become clear in a moment, there's a shoot here that divides into two subshoots at the bottom. And what happens in the experiment is there's a little mouse that's dropped down the top shoot. Now the mouse can come out one of two different ways. It's undetermined which way, where the mouse is going to come out. And children's task is to make sure that the mouse doesn't get hurt. So what they have to do is they have to put out pieces of cotton wool to catch the mouse at the bottom of the tube. Now the right thing to do is this, it's to put out two different pieces of cotton wool here because the, you don't know where the mouse is going to come out. It, the future is not determined yet. There's multiple ways in this instance, two ways in which the future might turn, turn out. So you need to cover both bases as it were. And what Sarah finds is that um, it's not until children are about five that they're putting out um, two different maps like this to catch the mouse, suggesting that they're, they're not realising potentially that there are these different possible ways in which the future might turn out. Okay, because of time, I'm going to skip the, the next study, which is about regret in children, and I'll just move to a final summary. Okay. So um, I've tried to argue for a distinction here between temporal updating and temporal reasoning. And I've suggested that children have to acquire temporal reasoning abilities. Those are not something that are basic. Um, but there may be an intermediate stage when they can do more than temporal updating, but less than temporal reasoning. And that's what I'm calling this event-based event notion of time that children have at this stage. Before um, uh, time, they have uh, representations of time that are systematically organised. Um, oh, sorry, I'm going to I'm going to stop there. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Very interesting, completely different to the first talk, <laughs> yes. which is what we were hoping for. Okay. Um, we now have time for discussion. So, does anybody have any questions? Can be to any of the speakers. It can be to panelists over there. that these are things that actually happen to the child is that if, if there are things that happen to the child, the child will typically experience them in the order in which they actually happen because the, those are experiences that the child are, is actually having. So what we're trying to do is set up a situation in which um, that isn't the case, that they don't find out about changes in the order in which those changes happen. So that kind of places a constraint on um, how we can actually carry out the task. You're, you're correct that children have to think about these other characters and things that are going on. Um, but there is a task that's a bit related to this task, originally carried out by Daniel Pavanelli, that involves the child themselves. So what happens in Pavanelli's task um, is the child themselves is sitting in front of um, two boxes. So imagine there's a red box and a blue box <coughs> behind me. Okay? And what happens is the child plays one game. And what they don't realise is behind them, the experimenters um, uh, putting an object into one of the boxes. This is videotaped. Okay? Then the child plays a second game, and again, an experimenter comes and takes the object out and puts it into the other box. Okay? So now a change has happened behind the child that they have not actually been aware of at the time. And now what happens at the test phase is that children are simply showing the videos of what happened 
with them, with them playing the two different games, and these, the experiment are doing the stuff behind them. So now they can see what happened behind them. And the manipulation in Pavanelli's study is that he varies whether children see those video clips of game one playing and game two playing in the correct order or in the jumbled up order. And what he finds um, is something similar to what we find, is that children of this sort of age range have difficulty with those sorts of, um, that, that sort of task, in which again they have to make an inference from, well that happened during game one, that happened during game two, so that's where the object is now. Now it's not perfect, it does involve the child in a way that our own task doesn't, uh, 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 doesn't involve the child, but nevertheless the, the events in question are things that are going on sort of um, independently of what the child is actually doing. Uh, it's another question for Teresa. It seems to me that your hypothesis makes a prediction about the acquisition of tense mm -hmm. in languages that have a tense system that includes tenses where you have to keep track not just of the speech time and event time but also mm -hmm. a reference time. Yep. So, for example, yep. he had already gone to the store yep. by the time yep. I came home. Yep. Um, do we know whether that's true? Uh, whether children so, in other words, your prediction should be that, um, first of all, uh, you know, in the event, uh, in the solely kind of event categorizing mm -hmm. stage, mm -hmm. um, things like the past part perfect should not appear yeah. in spontaneous yeah. speech, yeah. but yeah. also that by the time children use it, they should be able to do yes. the tests. I completely agree. Okay, so I think um, uh, there, there may well be some tight link between uh -huh. being able to coordinate speech time, event time, and reference time, and actually be able to think about, to do the type of temporal reasoning that, that I'm talking about. I mean, what we do know, uh, maybe you are a linguist, what we do know is that those kind of more complex tenses are acquired later on in development um, uh, than um, the simpler tenses that don't seem to require separating out event time, speech time, and reference time from each other. We have one last question, then we have a break, but please keep your questions in mind and we'll ask them, and you can ask them um, in the second discussion round. Please. Um, you talked mainly, sorry, this is a question to you again. Um, you talked mainly about reasoning. Mm -hmm. And to take a spatial example, we all know of the famous Piaget experiment where children are asked what's the level of water in a mm -hmm. container or whatever, and they yeah. get it wrong. But on the other hand, if you ask them to pour water out of a kettle, they can do it. Mm -hmm. So it's making a distinction. They're not able to reason, but they are able to act. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder whether the same might be true, that all your data experiments so far have been on reasoning. Is there any evidence that, in some sense, they uh, do appropriately act, even though they can't reason in time? OK, so um, clearly they have certain kinds of temporal mechanisms in place, even at this stage. Uh, so, for example, they're very good at remembering order, temporal order information. Um, they can, in deferred imitation tasks, or even verbally, they can describe the order in uh, the order in which events happen. Um, so, um, and also, they, they can clearly they show evidence of sensitivity to temporal duration um, in their behaviour as well. What's very difficult to figure out is what would count as a non-verbal demonstration that children are capable of tense thought. Um, so I think that that is in some ways is the crux of the matter. If we could really try to figure out a way of demonstrating um, non-verbally whether or not children are capable of tense thought, then, well, I would be much more famous than I am. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a short break now. If you want to go out, we have some refreshments for you. Those of you who raised the fingers, please, um, I will pick you first in the second discussion round, so don't go anywhere um, and keep the questions in mind, please. Thank you again to our speakers for the first half. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us, um, I need to make a correction. I'm really sorry. Um, clearly, my time cells don't work terribly well tonight. Um, so next year, the topic is, in fact, going to be adolescent risk-taking. Um, and then criminality and the brain is the event that Val McDermott, who is a science writer and who used to be an undergraduate at St. Hilda's, uh, will attend. And art and the brain is in the following year. So apologies for that. But it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Robin Le uh, Padouin from the University of Leeds.
who is going to ask whether the passage of time is all in the brain. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to be here this evening. Um, well, Teresa started her talk with a quotation, and I'm going to do the same, uh, though it's not Nietzsche. The clock ticked, the moving instant which, according to Sir Isaac Newton, separates the infinite past from the infinite future, advanced inexorably through the dimension of time, or, if Aristotle was right, a little more of the possible was every instant made real. The present stood still and drew into itself the future, as a man might suck forever at an unending piece of macaroni. Every now and then, Beatrice actualized a potential yawn. That is uh, Aldous Huxley's um, somewhat whimsical description of perhaps the most salient fact about time, that it passes. Now, I say fact, but actually some people are inclined to deny that it is a fact, an objective, mind-independent fact, that time passes, if we understand that in terms of events becoming present and then ever more distantly past. But even those who deny the objective passage of time will concede um, that the apparent passage of time is uh, an all-pervasive aspect of our experience. Time certainly seems to pass, uh, they say. So the question I want to ask uh, today is whether um, the various features of our uh, experience of time need to be explained in terms of an objective passage of time or whether we can explain these features without appeal to an objective passage of time. So let me start by uh, drawing some comparisons and contrasts between uh, our experience of time on the one hand and our experience of space on the other. So the first feature, we might say, is that we have a sense of a shared now. We have a sense that you and I are at the same moment in time. And indeed, if that were not the case, uh, I would have some difficulty communicating with you uh, right now. Um, but we don't have the sense of a shared here. I mean, OK, we are in the same uh, room, but that's, uh, that's a purely contingent you didn't need to be here uh, today, and indeed, even to communicate with you, um, I don't need you to all be in this room. We could be distributed around the college, and I could be delivering this uh, talk through a megaphone, or perhaps by radio link, or something of that kind. Um, so we don't have to have a shared here, and certainly not in the sense of occupying the same point in space, which would be uh, uncomfortable, probably impossible anyway. Um, change. That's another feature of our temporal experience. We're aware of change uh, all the time. For example, uh, I have um, changed in terms of my height. Uh, there was a time when, uh, like you, I was three foot tall, and now I'm approximately twice that, um, probably slightly less. I've reached that point in my life where I'm starting to shrink a little bit. Um, what's the spatial equivalent of that? Well, we might talk about spatial variation of properties, my body exhibits different widths at different places. Um, but with spatial variation, it seems to be different objects which are exhibiting these different properties. Uh, this part of my body has this width. This part has a different width. These are different objects. Whereas we don't think of different parts of us being uh, three foot tall and uh, six foot tall. Rather, it's me as a whole that was once three foot and now six foot. Um, and then thirdly, we have a sense of time's direction. The direction from earlier to later seems to be something intrinsic to time. Uh, there are no intrinsic directions in space. We can, of course, um, distinguish directions in space north, south, east, and west, but these are purely conventional. We don't think that that reflects uh, real directions in space itself. Uh, there are no uh, directions in space which are, as we're constraining our, our behavior in the way that direction of time constrains 
uh, our behavior. So three contrasts then between our experience of time on the one hand and our experience of space on the other. Uh, do these features intimate a genuine passage of time or can we explain them in terms uh, which don't refer to a passage of time? Well, let's look first at the idea of a shared now. Um, we have this sense that we're all experiencing uh, the same present. We're all in the present. Well, that can't quite be true. Um, if there is such a thing as an objective present, it's the uh, boundary between past and future. And according to actually an argument that goes back to medieval times, that present, that objective present, if there is such, can't be extended, it can't be temporally extended, because if it were, it would have earlier and later parts. And those earlier and later parts can't all be present. If the earlier parts are present, then the later parts must be future. If the later parts are present, then the earlier parts must be past. From which we derive the conclusion that the present itself must be instantaneous, has no dimension whatsoever. But that's not our experience. Our, that's not our experience of the present. You're hearing my voice now. What is that? What is the sound that you're hearing? It's a vibration. A vibration is a change. You can't confine a vibration, which you can detect, to uh, uh, an instantaneous moment. It takes time. And that is why people talk of the experience present as a specious present. It seems to be present, but it doesn't correspond to the uh, objective present, if there is such a thing. There's another sense in which we don't perceive the present, a um, rather obvious sense. Uh, what we're perceiving, what we're registering, is in the past. Uh, why? Because light and sound, uh, two means by which we become aware of the character of things, what they're doing, uh, they take time to reach us. And of course, we have to factor in a bit of time for us to process the perceptual information that we're getting. So by the time we've registered an event, uh, it's slipped into the, the past. Uh, normally, we're not particularly aware of this kind of thing, but of course, you look up in the night sky and you see stars, some of which, which are many light years away, um, you're looking at the distant past, and you may well have had that uh, uh, amusing thought experiment where you imagine being instantaneously transported to some point 500 light years away with an incredibly uh, powerful telescope, and by that means, by focusing on the Earth, you can witness uh, the Middle Ages unfolding. Um, so what might explain this sense that we have of a shared now? Is it because we are in uh, a shared now? Or might there be another explanation? Well, I think we can give another explanation. It's in terms of the speed at which light and sound travel pretty fast, and also uh, comparing those rates with the rate at which things change. So supposing we are looking at a clock. There's no clock actually here, but I'm sure you can imagine one. We're both looking at a clock, and we're communicating with each other, and we are uh, uh, asking each other what time is it, and we will agree what time it is. Why? Because um, light really doesn't take too much time to uh, move from the clock uh, to our retinas, and uh, we process the information pretty quickly in comparison uh, with the rate of change in the clock itself. The minute hand, for example, is, is moving quite slowly. Um, so we are going to agree what time it is. Uh, that's our sense of shared now, that we agree how things are in our environment. But now imagine that uh, light, for example, travels much more slowly than it in fact does, and that perhaps we take a little bit longer than we in fact do to process uh, the information. Perhaps we're, we're quite a distance from each other. Maybe you're nearer the clock than I am. I'm quite a long way off. Um, and by the time we've managed to look at the clock, get the information, communicate with each other, we find that there are some quite serious discrepancies uh, between our judgments about what time it is now. And so this sense of a shared now actually evaporates. So the thought is this, this sense we do have as a shared now may depend on entirely contingent aspects of uh, the world. The fact that uh, light and sound and our information processing capacities are much faster, typically, than the rate at which the things that we're interested in uh, change. 
So not only do we uh, not uh, perceive uh, the present, but the present is something that we, to some extent, uh, construct. And um, here, if I can do this, uh, I'd just like to uh, exploit the amazing facility of YouTube to illustrate, yeah, uh, a couple of phenomena which may be very familiar to you. There we go. In fact, I think I can make that full screen. So this is the phi phenomenon. So what we have here is an array of uh, some blue disks. And what's going to happen, as you probably know, is that uh, each of these disks disappears in turn. Let's have that full screen so you get the full effect. Now, I hope that you're getting the sense of a single light disk uh, moving around anticlockwise. Are you getting that sense? Yes, oh, that's, that's, that's a relief. Uh, okay, so th there's, there's no, <laughs> there is no uh, white disk moving around anti, oh, oops. Now we better stop that pretty quickly, before, otherwise we find something completely inappropriate happening. Um, <laughs> uh, this is the danger of using YouTube, okay. So that's one phenomenon. Here's another, uh, the flash lag effect, slightly uh, less well known. Um, okay. So this comes with a bit of a narration on the screen, which will help interpret what's going on here. what really happened in front of your very eyes but hopefully that's not what you saw you saw the moving uh, cube whoops uh, ahead of the stationary one just call that sorry I'm a little bit slow back to the talk Oh, sorry, I'm, yeah. Just missed it. Oh, yeah, there it is. That's the one. Yeah, super. <laughs> yeah. See, I have such a facility with these, 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 uh, these technological things. Okay, so uh, what is the, um, what's the moral of those, those, those temporal illusions? Well, the thought is um, that you are seeing what the brain tells you you're, you're seeing. You're getting a certain amount of kind of retinal input, but you're putting in an interpretation on that. Uh, so in the case of the phi phenomenon, uh, what you're actually seeing are these blue discs disappearing in turn. But it's much simpler to imagine uh, uh, a single disc moving around anticlockwise. So that's what the brain thinks happened, and that's what you see. In the case of the phi phenomenon, uh, you're, as it were, anticipating the position of the moving cube. You've got information about this moving cube. The brain knows, in some sense, that know that uh, it takes a little while for the information to be processed, by which time the moving target, the moving object, will have moved on a little bit. And so the brain corrects for that by making you see where it, in fact, is. So the thought is perceiving the presence, so to speak, is not a purely passive process. It's in part. Uh, uh, something that we, we construct. But even if uh, perception involves interpretation and anticipation, uh, we can't actually perceive the future. Uh, I did give a related talk at some uh, uh, in institution where someone stood up and said, actually, I can see the future. Would you like me to tell you what I'm perceiving? So, well, maybe, maybe later. Um, so I, I, I assume that you agree with me, I hope that we can't uh, perceive the future. Why is that? Is that anything to do with the flow of time? Uh, is it because the future is not there? As Theresa suggested, it may be sort of indeterminate. It's not real, so it's, there's just nothing there to be perceived. 
Or is it instead something to do with the nature of causation? So perhaps the, uh, the arrow of time, the direction of time, is really the arrow of causation. That the direction from cause to effect is the direction from earlier to later, or rather vice versa. The direction from earlier to later just is the direction from cause to effect. The reason we can't perceive the future is that this would involve backwards causation. So on to our second feature, and I am going to speed up quite a bit now. Um, change. We perceive change. Um, is the perception of change something which intimates a real passage of time? Well, what if it didn't? What, what would the perception of time, uh, what, what would be the, the, the perception of change amount to? Well, maybe just one perception followed by another. But as the psychologist William James put it, a succession of experiences is not the same as an experience of succession. You could have one e perception of an event after another without perceiving the temporal relationship between those. What is it to perceive the second event as following from the first? Well, here again, we might appeal to causation. It's the fact that the perception of the first event causally impinges, colors the perception uh, of the second. The direction of time. Um, perhaps our sense of moving through time is really to be explained in terms of uh, accumulating memories. So this is a, an analogy I've uh, uh, borrowed from uh, uh, Fred Hoyle, not only a physicist, but also a novelist in his uh, spare time. Um, and this is from October the 1st is, is uh, Too Late, which is a, a terrific book, by the way. Um, and uh, two characters in this novel are having a discussion about the nature of time and one of them comes up with a, with a pigeonhole uh, analogy. Imagine the various states of our minds at different times as the contents of a series of pigeonholes. So here we have our, our uh, pigeonholes. There's a piece of paper in each pigeonhole. On that paper is some information about the contents of other pigeonholes. But each pigeonhole only contains information about pigeonholes to the left, not pigeonholes uh, to the right. And a little bit of information is added every time you go from, from left to right. And you would imagine the states of our mind to be somewhat similar, that we, as it were, uh, each successive state of the mind encodes a bit more uh, information. And so we have this sense of having moved from the earlier states, where there's less information encoded, to, uh, from, from earlier states to later states rather than vice versa. And uh, just to engage in a slightly wacky thought experiment, supposing we keep everything about this case uh, uh, the same, except that we just reverse the order of the direction of time. So we keep the causal relation between the states of the mind, our brain, at different times, accumulating memory, uh, from left to right, as it were, but we simply reverse the passage of time, would we notice the difference? And if not, does that suggest that the passage of time, the real passage of time, if there is such a thing, is purely epiphenomenal? Is the passage of time an illusion? Well, maybe that's too strong a conclusion to arrive uh, on the basis of the considerations I've put before you, but it looks as though we have at least a decent chance of explaining some of the characteristic disanalogies between the experience of time and the experience of space in ways which do not appeal to an objective passage of time, which might be one reason to think there isn't such a thing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. We're opening the floor for questions, and in the back, please. I was wondering how you'd account for the like, thought experiment that is to do with Einstein's idea of space-time, where like, if something's traveling at light speed, then everything that is traveling at light speed is the passage of time for, say that like, a train is traveling at light speed, for example, the people in that train would experience time in the same like, way that they would on Earth, but then 
when they got out of the train, more time will have passed than it would have on Earth. Like, I don't know if you've come across that, but... Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So, so time, time dilation. Yes, yeah, so, so uh, I mean, another reason uh, that people have often given for suggesting that there isn't an objective passage of time is that it doesn't fit with uh, cases of that kind and other relativistic effects. Um, so the thought is that if there is an objective uh, present that we're all in, um, any two present events are going to be simultaneous. In an absolute sense, they are uh, simultaneous for all observers, independently of the way they're uh, moving. And uh, one of the lessons of relativity, at least in its traditional interpretation, is that simultaneity is not uh, absolute in the way that it should be, if there were an objective passage of time, but, but, but rather relative. So that might be another uh, route to the, the conclusion I uh, was wanting to move towards. Right. Well, that <laughs> that 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 would be that would be a question for for, for a physicist. But um, uh, I mean, it, it, the explanation. Right. So I, I I didn't want to suggest that time itself was unreal. Uh, there are lots of features of time uh, that we can appeal to other than uh, objective passage. There's well, I, I talked about the direction of time. Um, the temporal order would be, uh, would be another thing. Uh, temporal metric, how long things last, would, would, would be another. So it's not as though in removing the passage of time, uh, you would be um, uh, giving up any other uh, property of time uh, to appeal to, uh, uh, in, in order to explain those kinds of uh, effects. But what the, what the detailed explanation is, uh, I couldn't tell you. Any other questions? If I might ask one or two. Oh, sorry, in the back. Hi, um, I had a question for Edmund Rolls. Um, so, um, if according to your model, um, distinct moments in time are encoded by distinct populations of neurons um, within one uh, episodic memory, does that mean that your model um, predicts a certain sort of time limit for uh, one episodic memory? Um, yeah, that's an interesting issue. Um, <coughs> Just a couple of things to say about that. So um, the longest decoding period I know of so far is about between five and th 30 minutes for reading out time from these time cells. Um, but it, it's early days, OK? Um, but you know, your point's an interesting one, and it might put s sort of some sort of limit on things. Um, <clears throat> One of the most interesting things is it looks as if the time mapping in the entorhinal cortex appears to depend on the duration that you have to time. So these time cells would most simply just be clocking away at a standard rate. But if it's you have to say time intervals of 10 seconds versus a minute, well, there's a bit of evidence, including from humans, that the time cells recalibrate themselves to that, which is quite interesting. Um, and that puts interesting constraints on the model. I see. Um, I have a question to Theresa McCormack um, about the reason for which you wouldn't want to have the children in these experiments experience these sequences? Does it have anything to do with maybe an innate mechanism of how we ourselves encode the time we're in, which kind of maybe relates to the fact that we have time cells or not? I was wondering about like 
any innateness theories connected to the experience of time or whether that's the reason for why you would not want to have children experience the time they're in or whatever. Uh, so, so just to be clear, um, the experimental setup that we're trying to achieve is that changes happen, okay, but children only find out about the order in which those changes happened retrospectively, okay? So they don't experience those changes as the changes actually happen. Because if they experience the changes as the changes actually happen in the order in which they happen, temporal updating on the model that I was just describing is sufficient in order to explain performance. Mm -hmm. But a temporal updating couldn't, be, couldn't explain a circumstance in which you get the information retrospectively and now you have to make some kind of inference based on your new knowledge about what happened at different points in time in the past. Um, so it's purely a logistical thing about um, uh, how you could possibly set up a situation in which changes happen to the child, but they are completely, you know, unaware of them. And, and they, but I mean, maybe there are things that could happen with regard to, I don't know, body changes and so on that you could, you you could um, make happen and, and sort of inform the child about them in some way afterwards. So it's, it's kind of just the, the, the sort of constraints of the experiment, that what we're trying to achieve with that experiment make it particularly difficult to set it up in ways other than what we've done it. Um, in terms of sort of what I would want to say about innateness, so I think hopefully it's clear from what I've said in the talk that I don't think that this temporal reasoning system is something that is innate, and I think there's an interesting developmental story to be told about where the types of concepts and temporal abilities come from that children acquire over a rel developmentally relatively quite a long time period. Um, with regard to what I've said about the temporal updating system of, uh, as I've just described it, which is just sort of a simple way of describing a, a way of, of, of keeping track of changes that do occur in the world without being able to represent time as a dimension, I see no reason to think of that as being something that couldn't be in it. I mean, that could be something that could be available um, to infants and also animals and so on. Um, whether it's the right, right way to talk about representing information is another question, and I'm sure not all um, uh, people would agree with that way of describing it. I think it would be fair also to say that most mammals show an inherent novelty preference, and that is an innate thing. So it'd be difficult to argue that you could have a novelty preference without any concept of time. So I think there must be some innate um, idea that you've experienced something more recently than something else. So I think those kind of capacities are innate. So we, we know that very simple organisms also can show novelty preference. And we know, you know from developmental psychology that babies show uh, novelty preference in preferential looking paradigms and so on. So you can, you can demonstrate that without any kind of verbal response in, in very young children. Can I comment on, on that? Um, so we know that there are novelty neurons in the brain and familiarity neurons, but all they're doing is storing a representation of something that's happened, and then the next time the same event comes in, they respond either a bit more if they're familiarity or a bit less. But that doesn't imply time. All it implies is the ability to store information, surely. Maybe now is not the time to try and sort it out, but that's just a thought, okay? Um, maybe someone else has a question. Well, I suppose uh, I must say that my cat shows a distinct non-novelty preference <laughs> and at certain times of the day when it thinks it needs to be fed. Um, it's uh, ahead of the game and ahead of me. Um, I'm not quite sure what that says about its sort of time um, cognition capacity, but um, it's as regular as clockwork in its things kind of way. However, I wanted to really to ask um, just a question about the, 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 the your talk about the patch, passage of time, and I wondered really how you could talk about the, the passage of time, and particularly since it was really oh, an ephemeral thing, when we are all, well, without mentioning the second principle of thermodynamics, if you like, considering that we are all irreversibly, time is in some way irreversibly thrown, going through all of us, and, and that is a central condition of the universe. Uh, and I wonder what is the utility, sir, by, 
What is the use to people of being told that the passage of time is in a fundamental sense an illusion? Um, oh, it, it, it's an example of the kinds of questions that philosophers often ask. Yes, what, what, the, the connection between reality and, and, and appearance. Um, uh, but well, really, it's, 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 it's just clocking into the old idea of time as being essentially reversible, the Newtonian idea. So it's, you know, no, it's, it's no, 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 no. I, 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 w- I wouldn't want to draw that conclusion. Than, rather than engaging with irreversibility. I think there is a sense in which time is uh, irreversible. I think there is with you and me and everyone in this room. <laughs> um, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't appeal to the second law of thermodynamics to explain the irreversibility of, of time because, as I understand it, um, it's simply a statistical uh, fact that disorder tends to increase. It's not logically impossible for it to, uh, to, to for order to, to increase globally. Whereas, uh, I suggested the direction of causation is, is something which is absolutely fundamental. That's, that's not something which is, uh, for the most part, uh, aligns with the direction of time, but it does, does so invariably. But you ask, what is the point of asking these kinds of questions? Well, you may know that um, letter that Einstein wrote to the widow of a friend, uh, where he, he said, um, this distinction that we make between past, present, and future is uh, uh, a stubbornly persistent illusion. And I think he intended that as providing some comfort. Comfort, Um, I don't know whether it would have that effect on you, Um, but it's something I've tried on myself (laughs) several times. When when, uh, someone you've lost um, uh, think, I'm simply in a different part of reality from them. It's not that they've sort of gone into nothingness and I'm still on that sort of one-way track. Well, but I, 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 I leave you people, to your, your Yeah, terms. people do tend to respond rather differently, I've found to that. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Professor Rawls. With the time cells, is there, are, is there anything known about when time seems to be um, ticking along faster than it actually is or slower than it is, so when it's subjectively at a different speed than the objective time, if there is such thing, or at least the clock time, and how the time cells Mm. respond to that differently? Um, No, we don't know that yet, Uh, but what I pointed out to you about the orbitofrontal cortex was, you know, I suspect what prompted your question, very, very peculiar that an orbitofrontal cortex lesion, which is involved in emotion, you see, should affect people's sense of time. So I suspect what's happening there is the clock is running at the normal speed, but you're a bit more impulsive than usual, and so you judge time to have changed. I suspect that's roughly what's happening there. Oh, can I ask a question? Yes. I was very interested in the notion of causation and so on, and I see that we're talking about the brain and the mind. So I used to think that uh, brain events caused mental events and therefore there must be a time lag. And we have so many philosophers here, I suspect, that uh, I'm sure they'll put me right on it. But my theory right now is that mental events and brain events are simultaneous um, so that there is no causation that's involved. Um, And instead, we're talking about levels of explanation. And, uh, you know, I used to worry about that, but that's my solution. Should I still worry about it? No, I I think that seems to be a a perfectly reasonable solution to the the problem. I mean, you simply identify the mental events with the the brain events. But as you say, you're talking at a different level of abstraction. I might just add, I think it gets a little more complicated because I suppose you could say, do we type identify or token identify? Mm. Um, So identify itself isn't sufficient yet. Um, And also there's the question, it may may be true that you can identify the events, but there's still a question about what we do with the predicates and then how we understand the predicates. So that's another possible question. The predicate distinction will come apart if you don't accept type 
identity so that we say whenever you have an event of this type, you have an event of that type. Mm -hmm. That would be, right, that would be um, a commitment to something occurring for all, something, all events similar. But if it's just a token, which is all you need really for physicalism, you just have the same event but different properties which you might say inhere in that event or however you want to explain it. So there are quite, it does give rise to further philosophical questions, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Physical event and mental event occur at the same time. Can you say that one causes the other? I used to think about um, computer programs, you see. And I type in the computer program, and then that causes the TTL in my computer to change. So there's a time delay there. But I've been forced into this simultaneous argument because otherwise um, <clears throat> one does run into this peculiar issue of mental events causing brain events. And it, the only solution, it seems to me, is to assume that we have levels of explanation and that they're simultaneous. But there we are. Maybe we'll discuss this a bit more later. But if, if they're simultaneous, then you could have a co describe a cause of producing the change in the subsequent yeah. uh, description of the physical universe, then that isn't possible in mental events and physical events. They just work side by side. So what I think, Mikkel, is that causality works within any one level. So I can have a mental event causing another mental event and a brain event causing another brain event, and their time works as it should. Um, but across the levels, I have to think that they're simultaneous. But someone might put me right. I think you could argue that observation shows that they're not simultaneous. If you look out of the window and somebody on the other side walks past, the first instant when you see him is not that the tip of his nose passes the edge of the window, but when just in front of his face is what you try to do. It is when most of his head passes. Yeah. So the perception of this person must occur somewhat later than the physical event of light from his head being able to yeah. get to your eye. We could talk about that for a long time, Michael, but it could be that you need a bit more evidence to assume it's a person than just their nose. Um. That may be. Um. That means you also have the time to have heard that evidence before the mental perception occurs. Yes. Yes. Um, I also had a question for Therese, and of course other um, people might have comments as well, um, which is it occurred to me that um, the development of temporal reasoning as you describe it has um, possibly follows a similar time course to that one would expect if it had some relationship to childhood amnesia that um, we that most people uh, don't really remember things consciously that happened before they were around three and a lot of people um, might, for a, uh, with regard to events of a year or two or even more after that, remember things um, in a rather disconnected, episodic way so that um, they don't remember it really as a continuous stream of events. And I was wondering if this um, might be related to the development of temporal reasoning, that perhaps a degree of this is useful in coordinating our memories. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'd really like to, be, to say is, yes, you're completely right that this is the explanation of childhood amnesia, <laughs> um, that children below a certain age don't have uh, particular types of temporal concepts, and that means that they don't have um, episodic memories available to them, and that means that um, subsequently, later on in development, they're unable to remember um, their personal past. I think what, there's a number of things that make that difficult. One is that it's quite clear that even though, say, three-year-olds don't have some of the temporal reasoning abilities that we talked about, a parent of three-year-old will tell you that they are able to recall pieces, bits and pieces of information from the past. Um, and um, So the information is, is there in some format or another. Um, 
and the, the question is whether you'd want to say that they're entirely lacking an episodic memory um, when they don't have a particular temporal ability. Another thing that makes it difficult is that the age of childhood amnesia seems to change itself developmentally. So as children get older, as they go into middle childhood, um, the, the, the how far back that they can remember into their own childhood changes. So it's not that there's a fixed point in which um, you know everybody can remember back to when they're three and, and not yes. from before and so on. The actual point of uh, point at which um, uh, you can remember back itself seems to change as a function of age. Um, so I think both of those things make it slightly tricky to just straightforwardly say that. Um, uh, temporal reasoning abilities, A, are essential for episodic memory, although I recognise I have said that in the past in, in papers back in the 1990s, but also that, um, uh, uh, that um, it's also an explanation of why, as adults, we can't remember that time period. But I, I, I agree there's a very intriguing, there's three intriguing time periods involved here, intriguing, potentially intriguing relationships. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just very briefly, Michael. Um, so these were patients who had orbitofrontal surgical lesions, in fact, performed for tumors and epilepsy. And so um, there were two things that, that they were asked to do. One was to produce time. Produce, so they were asked to produce, say, 10 seconds. And then after seven seconds, they would say, oh, the time is up. And then we'd also give them an interval, perhaps 20 seconds, and we'd ask them how long was that interval, and their time estimation would be perhaps 25 seconds. So both those phenomena work in those patients. Very peculiar. Mm. I, I was wondering if time is required to form episodic memories, doesn't that prove that there's such a thing as time? I think that's very difficult. I, I'm, I'm still down as the, the no. denier of time because I'm not. <laughs> I'm just curious. Are you asking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody? Well, I, I think there's a there's a causal story to be told there, and I think I think wherever you have causation, you have time. Uh, I'm inclined to think that the temporal phenomena are explained fundamentally in, in, in causal terms. So, yes, I, I think the, the mechanism of episodic memory would imply the reality of time. I, I think there's something quite interesting about that, though, particularly based on what Robin said earlier, which is that the thing we know about patients with hippocampal lesions, hippocampal damage, is that they, have strugg they struggle to form new memories, so they can't remember events that have happened to them. But they also cannot think about future events and describe adequately things that might happen in the future. But they don't have a problem living in the present. So they can hold a conversation with you, a completely coherent conversation, as long as the time is not going too far so that they forget what the thread of the, of the conversation was. They can, they can perform very well in IQ tests. So they have a coherent um, capacity for temporal reasoning and processing within a fairly narrow framework. So they can exist in the present, but their trouble is with the past and with the future. So it kind of suggests there's maybe different neural substrates for that different type of temporal processing. So I wondered if you had any, any thoughts on that. Yes, I think so the present you're describing there is, is, is in a sense the specious present. Okay. So it, 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 it is extended, it, it, it's, not, it's not absolutely dimensionless. So it, it, it does actually exhibit a certain temporal structure within it, there's sort of earlier and later parts. Uh, I mean, understanding a sentence, for example, re requires that. Um, it's just that its temporal extent is, is very, very limited uh, because of the constraints that they, uh, that, that they are under. But, I mean, I think that's another illustration of, of the fact that what we call the present isn't really the present at all. I have a comment, uh, if I may, on imagining the future. So there was a lot of discussion about this at the Big Irvine meeting on learning and memory, and the whole of the Larry Squire group was saying hippocampal patients uh, have no problems imagining the future. Um, it's only when you have frontal damage as well 
and more widespread damage. So that's an interesting little rider on that. So there may be a little bit of a back off in the literature from the idea that hippocampus per se is necessary for imagining the future. It looks like hippocampus in conjunction with bits of frontal lobe and so on. UCL patients, which um, Jenny Hasidis and other people tested mm. with that original study, mm. they had very circumscribed hippocampal mm. lesions. Mm. So they, they, because mm. they, they didn't have prefrontal yeah. damage, or at least no, nothing that could show up on, on an MRI yeah, scan. So yeah. that's a, 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 maybe a squire versus It may be a squire rest. versus everyone else. Yeah. I would like to say something about that. So your hippocampus has a finite capacity, which is set by the number of synapses on each neuron. Um, if you try and store more memories than that, that what happens in this class of attractor auto-association memory is you lose most of your memories. So there has to be forgetting. There has to be overwriting of previous memories in that particular episodic memory system. Otherwise, you run the risk of getting up to this critical limit. So I now regard um, forgetting as being rather beneficial, at least in the episodic memory system. There is, there is a formal capacity theorem. Hopfield started it off in 1982, and then we extended it to sparse representations and so on. So there's a formal theory that the hippocampus works like an auto-association net with a finite capacity. It's a theory, you know, there's a lot of evidence for it, but theories may fall. But the hippocampus is only needed for the formation of memories, and then later on they're stored elsewhere. And so you can, I can see why you can have limited capacity to remember recent events, um, because, you know, there's only so much you can remember, but to forget events that are long in the past, which happens all the time, facts that I used to know as a child, I don't know anymore. That's very different. And the question there is, is it really forgetting or is it not having access to these memories anymore? So if I can just comment on that, because, again, there's a technical issue. So you couldn't store more than a certain number in the hippocampus. Yeah. And that's, therefore, that. very helpful to be able to retrieve them yeah. to neocortex and set up what we call a sort of autobiographical semantic memory, which would be a history of things that have happened to you in the past, which will remain after you remove the hippocampus. Yeah, but you can forget from that memory as well. Yes. Or lose probably, access probably. to it. Probably, yeah. much harder, yeah. yeah. Can I ask one question, please? I, I was intrigued um, with time cells. Um, is there any merit in thinking that déjà vu has anything to do with time cells? I don't know. Um, we once um, discovered some neurons which we published in Brain in the anterior thalamus that responded to long-term familiarity. Um, it took a long time for them to build up. And we said, oh, well, maybe that's, you know, there's something odd that goes on in that bit of the brain when you have deja vu. But uh, we don't really know exactly what's causing deja vu. But there are certainly bits of the brain that are telling you that something is familiar. In fact, your perirhinal cortex does that. And that may be adaptive. You know, I know for example, this is my computer, because I've seen it lots of times, and there's a special bit of our memory system that does just familiarity. Is that related to the phenomenon? I'm not sure, Michael. Uh, can I ask everyone a question, two questions, actually? Um, one of those is because Michael is here in the audience, and I wanted to know um, whether you would argue that all types of duration processing are done in the way that you've described it in terms of these populations of neurons and that you'd like to do away with the idea of an internal clock entirely. Um, so that's one question. And that this oh, let me just answer that. No, I wouldn't do away with an internal clock in the sense that we now know there's a sh at least a short-term internal clock in the, med in the lateral entorhinal cortex and the hippocampus, which enables a rodent to time whether after, say, 10 seconds, it should do something. 
So there is an internal clock in that sense. But does it, does it operate in this kind of pacemaker, accumulator type way that people have talked about it? Or is it just come down to particular patterns of neurons that show the times of time profiles that you're talking about? Well, everything in the brain is just patterns of neurons. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and the second question I wanted to ask you was to, was to do with um, what you, what the way in which you're talking about these time cells and episodic memory. What you said was that you, you talked about time in the sense of temporal order. So if you have an episodic memory, things happen in a particular order. But the data that you showed was time in the sense of duration, as it were, that at particular durations, these neurons have particular firing patterns. And I, I guess my question is, how do those two things map onto each other in terms of encoding? Yeah. So uh, we know that these time cells do the sequence uh, memory for, from the eight-arm maze thing that I referred to briefly, remembering the order in which you visited different arms. Mm -hmm. And that form of memory is impaired by CA1 hippocampal lesions. Mm -hmm. So it certainly does it. The question is how? Well, look. If you remember the CA1 neurons, one goes off early, another one a little bit later. So you associate one arm with the first set of neurons, which are going for the early time, uh, another arm with the second set of neurons, and then all that happens is when they play back um, the same clock sequence inside your entorhinal cortex, you can read off first the object one, which is arm one, and second, the object two, which would be arm two. But say, say you carried out an, an ordered sequence of events much quicker than you normally would, or that oh, you're showing them oh, much quicker than you normally would, and so oh. on, so that order and duration come apart. Yes. Um, how, how um, we don't know. We don't but know. Uh, no. uh, but uh, as, as I say, um, these cells have already been discovered in humans, and when humans have to operate with different time scales. It looks as if the neurons are resetting. So that could be a solution to the question you asked, that if you have to operate with a different time scale in recall to learning, you can reset your time encoding neurons. But it, it's early days, you know. Um, these were only discovered a very few years ago. I need to. Yeah, um, just a quick question for Teresa. I just was interested, the difficulty with ch children in the future mm -hmm. and the age at which that seems mm -hmm. to be a, a, a cutoff point, I just wondered, how, does, it, does it in any way correlate with intention and the child's ability to intend? So I think most developmental psychologists would say that children are capable of intentional action much earlier than this. Okay. Right. And also that they understand or have some grip on um, what on, on other people acting intentionally as well. So they have some basic notion of that. So I think that comes in um, and quite you, a bit. Is, is it not the case that to have an idea of intention, to, or you think to operate with intention, you don't need any idea of the future? I'm just, that's the connection. Yes. Yeah. I would say that. Um, I also have a question for Teresa. Um, can you elaborate on how you think that kids develop temporal reasoning? Where does it come from? Okay, so I think that's absolutely a crucial question. And the truth is we have no empirical evidence to really help us answer that question. Um, some people who are interested in kind of social constructivist views of development that really think that conceptual change happens as a part of a social process have suggested that it's through conversation with um, adults about the past and about the future uh, that uh, children start to get some sort of sense of how events are ordered in time and also the causal significance of event order as well so the significance of you know this happened before this therefore this so um, I, I'm very sympathetic to that particular viewpoint I'm very sympathetic to the idea that there is something inherently social about the process of acquiring temporal concepts um, but we don't have really enough empirical evidence to, to really help us nail that, that, that particular issue. And also, um, you know, that there is an important issue there about the role that language acquisition plays, um, which goes side by side with, with the issue about sort of social construction of temporal concepts as well. Um, but I think those are really 
really fascinating issues about what the developmental mechanisms actually are. How do you get from this to that? If it's, uh, if it's social, does that mean that there's nothing developing in the brain which causes it to happen? No. no. So, th so there's no change in, in the... No, that's just, I mean, I think as Edmund said, that's just a different level of description. Yeah. It would be extremely odd if something happened, changed about the way that children thought and reasoned and there was no underlying associated brain change. That would be freaky and yeah. 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 very weird. So it's, you think it's a combination of both? I, th I think, as Edmund said, it's just a different level of a different level of yeah. description. Yeah. If I th well, it's a different level of description. But I suppose you could have an entirely sort of nativist account of how temporal concepts develop and think that there's just a part of the brain that switches on, you know, after a certain amount of neural development. So you could potentially take that sort of line on things. Um, I suspect that that isn't true and that children do have to have certain types of experiences, but that doesn't mean that there isn't any um, uh, underlying changes in, in brain yeah. structures yeah. and so on as well. I mean, I would perhaps um, support that and also add that there are many or several um, known situations where environment um, does lead both to changes in cognition and detectable ones in the brain, so that, for example, um, if children are for some reason not exposed to a first language um, in, relative, in childhood, then later on, if they are exposed to a language, they would typically develop normal vocabulary but impaired syntax, and one can um, tell from brain imaging that there are unusual patterns in brain activation and um, in, uh, to give a commoner example, children who have uncorrected squints um, don't, and don't have experience of binocular input are likely to have um, impaired binocular vision and it appears to be related to areas of the brain responsible for the binocular vision not developing fully, so that social and other environmental factors certainly can um, affect brain development, though we, we do have the problem of at what level one's explaining things. neuronal level. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, because it's been talked about when things go wrong, what happens, um, whether that leads on to sort of interventions, if we know things that, in that much detail, which is fascinating. Okay, so the question is um, whether the understanding of the brain, in perhaps in general, might lead to useful interventions. Yes. yes. Uh, well, uh, particularly because, you know, we've taken it down to the neuronal level. Yes. Absolutely. Um, funny enough, f for the hippocampus and memory, the sort of implication is we know which bits of the brain have to be spared if a surgeon goes in there. Um, one of the things I'm working on a lot now is depression. And we think that there's a similar network to the sort I've talked about, but in the lateral orbitofrontal cortex that remembers sad events. And it's too sensitive in some people. And there, there are direct implications for intervention which are being tested. So people put in a little bit of um, repetitive magnetic stimulation, and that appears to be a reasonable treatment for depression. So yes, that's why we do the brain research. Yeah, sorry, episodic memory in autism as well is an issue, and that sort of thing from maybe from our implications in this. Yes, yes, autism is also an interesting case, yeah. I agree. Okay, I think um, we're going to wrap it up here. Um, please join me in thanking our panelists and our guest speakers for wonderful presentations. <laughs>